Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders. His love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens. His love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. His love endures forever. Who made the great lights. His love endures forever. The sun to govern the day. His love endures forever. The moon and stars to govern the night. His love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt. His love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them. His love endures forever. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm. His love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder. His love endures forever. And brought Israel through the midst of it. His love endures forever. But swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. His love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness. His love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings. His love endures forever. And killed mighty kings. His love endures forever. Shion, king of the Amorites. His love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan. His love endures forever. And gave their land as an inheritance. His love endures forever. An inheritance to his servant Israel. His love endures forever. He remembered us in our low estate. His love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies. His love endures forever. He gives food to every creature. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. So, in this psalm, we learn something about the character of God, and we learn something about the nature of love. And those things are very important to the way that we live our life. One of the things I found fascinating in working on this psalm is that each line in the Hebrew text is only six words long, whereas the English text is much longer. You know, we tend to think that the English language is easily usable. It's obviously not. I mean, like the first verse here, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever, is 13 words. But in Hebrew, they can say exactly the same thing in six words, which is easier, I think. And this repetition of his love endures forever is very important. Now, the Hebrew never actually uses the word love, but in translating it in that way, it helps us to encapsulate in one word four different English words and I think if we use these four English words as a reference we find out what love really is you know very often in our 21st century world men will say to women or women will say to men, I love you, darling. Let's go to bed. And you realize that the person talking to you, you only met at seven o'clock tonight. And the word love might be somewhat cheapened. But in Hebrew, the word love 
joins together four different words. Faithfulness, kindness, loyalty, and goodness. Now, what it would be in our society if every time somebody used the word love, they meant, I am going to be faithful to you, I am going to be kind to you, I am going to be loyal to you, and I am going to be good to you. What an ideal world then, if two people in coming together were going to be like that to each other. That would make for a great marriage. And one of the things about our relationship to God is God who does not change. It can be said of him, his love endures forever. And his love is full of faithfulness, kindness, loyalty, and goodness. We change. And our lives are not always filled with faithfulness, kindness, loyalty, and goodness. But God is good. We're reminded of the instance where a man comes to Jesus and says, Good teacher. And Jesus says, Why do you call me good? Only God is good. Now, Jesus here was not denying that he was God. He was asking the man to reflect on whether Jesus was truly good and what it would mean about who he was if he was truly good. Because as we know in the Bible, if we believe its word to be true, all people do wrong and fall short of the glory of God. But God's love endures forever. And even the word forever doesn't really accurately translate what the Bible is saying here. Forever is something that I can't imagine. I don't know about you. Forever almost spreads on too long. But the Bible's word means kind of the idea of an extremely long time. Something that can be measured. God's love goes on for an extremely long time. Imagine where your life might take you. Imagine you live to be a hundred. And your life feels a little bit like it's falling apart at the edges. The one thing you can be assured of is that God's love will still be with you. And it is better to be a hundred and be surrounded by God's love than to be a hundred and be bereft of love. And you might think, well, no matter how old I get, my husband's love will always be with me, or my wife's love will always be with me, or my children's love will always be with me. But let me tell you this, that in every partnership, every couple, there will be one who dies first. And that is such a hard thing. Such a hard thing. Maybe you, by then, you will have been together for 50 or 60 years. And all of a sudden, that relationship will not be what it was Yes, you may well see that person again in heaven. 
but there will be a gap of time. And you might think, well, at that point, I will be able to rely on my children. I will give you a little inkling as one who has been on life's road a little while, not as long as some, but not as short as others, is children grow up. And as loving as they remain, they don't remain in your life to the extent that they were when they were six or ten or fifteen even. Life changes. They have new priorities. And those priorities will include you, as sad as it seems, to a lesser extent. That's why the human race and the Christian church invented the wedding vows, you know? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be brought together with his partner. We understand that. We maybe don't like the implications of it, but we understand it. And so, God is love, which means faithfulness, kindness, loyalty, and goodness, endures for a time that is measurable, not just forever or for eternity. You know, it's like we have to avoid the fairy stories here. You know, what's the last line in a fairy story? And they... They lived happily ever after. And it's like, you think, in Hollywood these days, they would make a sequel, you know? Goldilocks 2, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, The Eighth Dwarf, or something like that. And in the sequel, you would find out that maybe they didn't live happily ever after because in the sequel, if it was just, oh, get up in the morning, have a happy time dancing around with my dwarves and stuff like that, the story would get a little boring. So Holly would have to say that, oh, there's going to be some changes around here. It's not like that with God. Measure the time and he will still love you. And really that's what the psalm in its repetitions, the other half of the repetition does. It says, for example, in verse 5, who by his understanding made the heavens. In verse 6, who spread out the earth upon the waters. In verse 7, who made the great lights, the sun to govern the day, it says in verse 8. And in verse 9, the moon and stars to govern the night. So right at the very beginning, before there were any men or women to place their love, place his love upon, God was loving. He didn't need to make you in order to be loving. He didn't need to make you to have something to place his love on. You are not his plaything. God is love, as the New Testament tells us. And when men and women came into things, because God created them, he loved them as much as he loved or even more as the rest of creation. Some scientists have accepted that maybe before the Big Bang, there was something there that started the Big Bang. But they say that that thing went away. 
And they say, well, you can call it God if you want. But if we're smart, we'll realize that God has worked throughout history. And in this psalm, it recalls for us the way that God has worked in the history of Israel. And particularly at the time when Israel was in slavery to Egypt. You know, going to Egypt seemed like a really good idea. You know the story, as written by Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice. You know the story how Jacob and his sons, with the exception of one who was already there, went to Egypt and found out, in contrast to Israel, where there was no food, in Egypt there was lots of food. And so... They said, hey, la, happy day, we'll settle in Egypt. Pharaoh is a good king. And then Pharaoh got his employees to show them these things called bricks. And he gave them some straw and said, why don't you make some bricks? And Israel said, how long should we make bricks for? And he said, forever. You know? I don't know if you've ever thought about the story. I was talking about fairy tales. But the story of the three little pigs. You know that one? Do they have that one in Brazil? Fab. Yeah. Um, you know? And the first little pig made his house out of straw. And by the time you get to the end of the story, the third little pig made his house out of bricks and you know the idea that the wolf huffed and puffed and couldn't blow down the house of bricks i wonder if you've ever made the connection that in egypt the bricks were made out of straw so the pigs weren't that smart really you could have made the bricks for the first house by the straw you already had you know i sit up at night worrying about these things and so it goes. But God loved Israel and wasn't content to let them remain in Egypt as slaves. Perhaps in Egypt as free men, but not in Egypt as slaves. And so he brought them out of Egypt he opened the Red Sea before them, and they went across on dry land. And Pharaoh, clippity-clop, clippity-clop, went after them, and the sea closed. And you know the rest. And that's just messed up my recording now, because there will be a peak on that recording I can't get rid of, uh, which means that nothing else will normalize. You don't even have to know what normalize means, but it'll cause me a problem tomorrow when I'm sorting this out. We don't like to think about that Pharaoh and his armies drowned. But the love of God means sometimes that he would judge evil men. The kind of evil men who make slaves the kind of evil men who try to create unjust kingdoms. You know, and for the people of God, every empire that has enslaved them has gone. Egypt, Rome, and even the great Babylon, all gone. God's people rise above but not because God's people are great, but because God is great. And so God remembered his people in the past. There have been instances in your life, if you think about it hard enough, where God has remembered you. And it has been obvious. But God also 
remembers us in the present. It says in verse 23, he remembered us in our low estate. Now this doesn't apply if you're a rich person. If you're a millionaire, doesn't apply. I suppose these days to be rich you have to be a billionaire. Millionaires don't impress so much anymore. But God looks after the poor. It says he gives food to every creature. And it is a biological and mathematical fact that there is enough food in the world to supply for everyone. The important word is share. And that is what we have been thinking about here today. And sharing takes us into the future. Because today there might be people who are hungry. But if we share, then tomorrow there will be less people who are hungry. And God's love endures forever. And that means that when your time has come, and for some of us that might be when we are 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 or 100 or 110. You know, there's that guy in the Old Testament, I don't know if you read about him, Methuselah. You know, you could live as long as Methuselah and God's love would still be with you. And so God's love in creation, God's love in the past, God's love in the present, and God's love in the future. His love endures forever, a measurably long time. You know, sometimes after your faith in Jesus has meant that you arrive in heaven, you might think, I wonder how, the, how long this goes on. And the thing is, that's when forever really kicks in. You know? I saw a cartoon the other day, not a Looney Tunes cartoon, but a drone cartoon in a newspaper or something. And, you know, usually it is St. Peter who stands at the gates of heaven and considers whether people will be able to come into heaven. And this time he was sitting on a throne at the gates of heaven because obviously the disciples of Jesus also have thrones in some sense that I don't understand to play a part in what takes place and come into the gates of heaven were a dog and a cat and he said to the dog what about you have you been a good boy and the dog said yes I have followed all the instructions my master gave me I chased off any stray dogs, and I always ate my food. And St. Peter said to the cat, Have you been a good girl? And the cat said, Why are you sitting in my chair? <laughs> we don't get into heaven because we are good or bad, but because we are forgiven for the wrongs we have done. And that promise of forgiveness endures forever because God's love endures forever. Amen.